comes to us and moving on to the table of duties. Uh, I don't visually just seem right here, but Reverend Dr. Corcox talked uh, about the catechism and his book on this and education. It's good to read. I want to see what he has to say about it. But then just going to think about how that might play into the education uh, for virtue and the school. All right, uh, bouncing over to another text from Luther, uh, from Freedom of Christian, we're going to go to a few other ones. So just to remind us, you know, Freedom of Christian, Luther was looking at the inner man, the outer man. Uh, or as I, you know, talked about it from Psalm 1, roots to fruits. Uh, and that the outer man produces truly virtuous works, right? Uh, Paul Althaus. Uh, this book, at least in English, I think, not 72, uh, a German Luther scholar. Uh, he has a book on the ethics of Martin Luther. The bookstore here has it. If you've not read it before, it's a nice and content, very good companion on the Luther side. You can take freedom of the Christian, all the volumes, and condense it into one point. That'd be like all, all houses book. And he has his, his opening, you know, salvo on, on Lutheran ethics is this. I mean, like the first lines, basically, of the book. Justification by faith determines Christian ethics because for the Christian, justification is both the presupposition and the source of ethical life. You know, hence the importance of that. Um, it's the ground of being you know, from which we gain our being and justification and move about in it. the same. Obviously, it's been pointed out, but it's a nice encapsulation. And if you want to read the book, it's there for you. Now, Luther develops this more in a treatise on good works. And I honestly don't know which came before the other. I just know in treatise on good works, it's developed more um, than in, in Christian life because he's looking at the whole expanse of it. And in Treatise on Good Works, part of what Luther's responding to is the knock that he's against good works, which is not the case at all. He's, he's trying to rightly place faith in works. And so he writes this uh, as an extra, uh, you know, extrapolation on where should, go, where should good works be, be in the Christian life, uh, what does that look like in relation to faith. And, you know, what he's pitting in against are these man-made works, whether they're secular, but a lot of times it's the sacred ones that are you know, working against. So you must do these greater works in order to be truly virtuous, truly holy, truly righteous. And so it's these vain dead works, and he uses those terms in there. They're vain because they don't do anything, they're dead because they don't produce any really any goodness. Uh, they appear to bring righteousness because people say they're good to do, and therefore you do them, therefore they appear to be righteous, but they're not at all. all right. uh, so, you know, what he's been pointing to is uh, if you want to find out what good works are, well, you know where to go, go to the dead wall, right? Here's where God tells you what to do. And so, he spends the entire rest of this piece, which is like over 100 pages, on uh, the Decalogue. Most of what he writes about is the first commandment, then the second, then the third, and then it gets, you must get ten or nine inch or something, because then it gets short shrift and some of it, and the cover is like, we all understand <laughs> Well, that's actually the one that most people don't understand, but okay. Um, and, and throughout this, Luther continually makes the comment that, look, if you want to if you want to do good works, just look at look at the Decalogue and look at your vocations in life, and put those two together, and you're not going to have any end of good works to do. Right? So you don't need to go around trying to devise good works and say these are better than, right, more righteous than. You have plenty to do. Just with the first command, you have plenty to do in life. When you give ten, that's way too much. So, you know, we don't need to come up with all sorts of uh, cultural mores and think that those are more important than and make us truly righteous. Just do these. Right? 
Uh, so I'm not going to give you a quote on that. Just trust me, it comes up again and again and again. And I'm sure you've, if you've read Luther, you've probably come across that point. Now, the place where Luther spends most of his time is with the first man. And the first good work <coughs> is faith. Now, where does he get this from? What? It goes to the Decalogue, right? Now, we can have debates about what the first word is on this, right? You know, uh, Jewish people would hold that the first word is, I am the Lord of God who delivered you from Egypt. I have a lot of sympathy for that because that sets the tone for everything else that's set after that. But if we want to divide it like we do as Luke and the Catholic say the first, you know, word is an actual command of having the God before me, that's fine. But don't forget what comes before it. Why should we have no other gods? Right? Because Yahweh has delivered us. That's why. So in some sense it's an obligation, but okay, that's like a nice obligation, right? You you mean I get to have no other god but the one that delivered me? So this is the first good word, because that's what God says. I have no other gods besides me. That We could press out the preposition on this one. Is it beside, or before, or after, whatever it is. Whatever the point is, you know, I'm it. Okay. So as Luther says there, the first, highest, and most precious of all good works is faith in Christ. And just so you know, this is the good work of God. And that might sound a little confusing. So the first good work I'm supposed to do is not something I do. Yeah. And good for you, right? Because <laughs> you could do it. Um, hence the first part. I'm the Lord your God. Who? Okay. Made you. Elected you. Redeemed you. And with you. Right? All those sort of things. So this is the first good work. And God gifts it to you. Okay. Now... In a place uh, in 1519, Luther has another piece called Two Kinds of Righteousness. And in Two Kinds of Righteousness from 1519, he makes a distinction between alien righteousness and proper righteousness. Uh, If you read in contemporary Lutheran theologians, they'll most likely talk about this as passive and active, okay? So let's know something about language, right? Passive verbs are what kind of verbs? (laughs) You're talking to a third grader, okay? What does that mean? Something else is acting. Something else is acting on you. You are receiving, right? You are the object. Okay, whereas active, we're obviously the doers of it, okay? Now, this is important. Verbs matter, right, in Scripture. And in this case, when Luther's talking about alien righteousness, he's talking about that righteousness which comes from outside of us versus proper righteousness and the things that we are appropriately to do. Okay? Passive righteousness is that which we receive. Active righteousness is that which we then do. Okay? So the first move in the Decalogue, Luther says, is faith, and that is a good work. That is a virtue. But it's something you receive. It's alien, it's from outside of you, it's given to you. Okay. Then the rest that follows would be put in the category of proper righteousness, that which you are meant to do. So faith must be connected to in the first link excuse me, in the other virtues, since as Luther says there, faith alone makes all other works good, acceptable, and worthy because it trusts in God alone. Again, faith alone makes all other works good, acceptable, and worthy because it trusts God alone. And he's going to press this out quite a bit. It may not be the way we're used to thinking about virtue and good works. So Luther explains it this way. Something like this, right? The person who trusts in God's gracious salvation in Christ fulfills the first commandment. Right? We're obviously seeing this as more than simply the deliverance from Egypt, but deliverance from slavery for the capital S, right? The person who trusts in Christ for salvation fulfills the first commandment, and everything else done 
is good and pleasing in God's eyes. Now here's a quote. That's a pastiche, but it's all of one kind of thing. In this faith, all works become equal. All distinctions between works fall away. There's no greater or lesser works in terms of what God's really pleased with. All distinctions between works fall away, whether they are great, small, short, long, many, or few. For the works are acceptable not for their own sake, but because of faith, which is always the same and lives and works in each and every work without distinction. The works are acceptable not for their own sake, but because of faith. We'll, we'll press this out. Okay. So Luther's saying, look, the first word is meaningful. It's the primary thing. Good faith, trust in God is a good thing. And God gives it to you. And that's the thing that makes everything else a, pre- a believer does good and pleasing in God's eyes. Now that sounds like a big white statement. Um, and, and I don't imagine that Luther's saying like, well, at this point I'm going to disagree with Paul and really you can do whatever you want. You can be as vicious as you want. That's good too. Now, he's, he's, he's looking at, of course, all the other things you might do in life, which would, of course, be the honorable works, but even the ones that you would consider to be indifferent works, adiaphora, the those things which you have freedom in. Whether you do this or do that, that's good, too, when you do it in faith. Okay. As opposed to what? So maybe this is easier to understand by seeing its opposite, okay? So the, the person who doubts God's gracious salvation and instead trusts in the self and its works, right, which of course are sinful, trusts in the self and its works in order to save the self, right? This is, the works themselves are sinful by their nature because we are, right? But the very fact that you're doubting that God is gracious and, and saving, and instead looking to one's own works to bring about righteousness and salvation, makes you the God, and turns you into the idol, breaks the first commandment, and then everything else that's done is done, you know, colored by this doubt of God and trust in a false idol yourself and your own works, and makes all those actions you then do bad, sinful, even if they're good for other people. Okay? Even if the words, those words outwardly look good and virtuous and are helpful to other people, God sees them as sinful because of you and your motive. Okay? This is the distinction Luther's drawing out here is what's done in faith and what's not done in faith. Okay, so he appeals to Paul here in Romans 14, whatever is not done of faith or in faith is sin, period. He's taking those words very seriously. Faith matters a bunch, right? Capital B bunch. So with faith, as Luther says, all other works receive a borrowed goodness. And and so one of the major points Luther's making here is that instead of focusing on the what am I doing, um, because people always want to know the what, of actions, right? Uh, it's not. It's not that the works themselves are intrinsically good, uh, but you know they're good or dead based on who's doing them in relation to God. This is very relational ethics. And I already talked a little bit about neighbor-centered ethics, motivated by the gospel, motivated by what Christ God does for me through Christ. And right, I, I want to know what my neighbor's needs are, and I want to take care of them. Right, vertical, horizontal. That way. Uh, that's, you know, I, I hate, hesitate 
taking this term situational ethics can be taken very wrongly, but I mean, there's this kind of vocational situational ethics here. So, you know, who's doing them? The person who has faith, trust that God really saves, and lets God do that saving work, because that's what, who God is and what God does, right? And therefore goes and does all these other things, trusting that God's taking care of that, right? But whatever that person does, that's good and pleasing in God's eyes, because that person's disposition is trust and works that out. Right? First, the person who doubts God says, no, 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 I don't trust you. Right? It's my own goodness that's going to get me through. Whatever good that person does for other people isn't seen as good in God's eyes. Because it's, it's fundamentally breaking the first thing, which is to trust God and who God is and what God does. Right? It replaces God with the self. It's for the self. It's turned in on the self. Okay? And so it's not, it, it's the who, right? And the who can never be separated from the relationship with God. So, in, in addition to, uh, you, know, you see there, faith, and I'll, I'll use the term coloring, right? It colors it. You want to say it's rose color, that, that helps us in multiple ways, that, that's fine, whatever you want to do, throw that one away. That colors it is good. Uh, but Luther also argues, you know, again, that, that faith is a font, right? It causes all truly good works. Naturally so, like the tree. Uh, here's a pastiche of quotes from this long treatise that, that hit on the same note. Faith is the chief work and the life of all other works. It gives, gives life to them. All good works must be done in faith and proceed from faith. Faith is the master workman and the motivating force behind the good works. Okay, this is the cause of these truly good works. So not only colors them as good because it's done in faith, it causes them. And finally, and this just gets a, a slim mention in the big text. For us, this would be the major thing we want to maybe run to, right? Well, that we're forgiven. And God sees, okay, that's true too. But that's actually the, the third thing he brings up and I had to hunt and peck for that one. I, have to read. I know it. I marked it somewhere when I read it and I had to because his nature one is the coloring. It also causes, and oh, by the way, it also does this, right? That, that faith makes works good because when you trust in God's grace, faith covers the sin of our works, making them good in God's eyes, right? This is the atonement idea, the covering. In, in, in Hebrew, the word for atonement is to cover over, right? You put blood over things, it covers over the, the blocks. There's the washing away after you know, injury. That's more New Testament. It's the covering over of things. You got holes in the wall, let's back all that and take that over, right? That kind of idea. So, you know, here's, here's a good Luther quote on this one. A man knows that all his life and works are nothing but damnable sins in the judgment of God. He must despair. <laughs> That's like one of those major Lutheran verbs despair entirely of his works and believe that they cannot be good except through this faith with expects no judgment but only pure grace, favor, kindness, and mercy from God. Okay? So why are the Christian works good? Because they're rotten fruit. I can see this. Right? Well, because they're forgiven. Okay? Now, let's be honest. Right? And here you can get Luther with this at the same time saint and sinner. He doesn't use that language, but you get that feel of it, right? But, but our works are also good, because on the same side, our faith causes us to do good works. Right? And, and on the faith side, first and foremost, it colors everything you do as good, because you trust in who God is for you. And God sees that as good and is pleased with it. And the verb please comes up, it's, you know, it's the kind of literary term Leibniz, it's one of those, those repeated words that comes up again and again. Like in Genesis 1, one of the major Leibniz, one of the major theme words is good. Good, 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 good. Uh, in, in this one, it's, this is what pleases God. Please, 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 please. This is what pleases God. Faith, 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 faith. Whatever is done in faith is good. Whatever is not done in faith is not good. Period. Right? It's because it's fundamentally about who and that relationship with God. 
So yeah, there's obviously a what component. That's why we have the decalogue. But the first place the decalogue starts with is it's with relationships. Well, that so the whole thing is about relationships, right? With God and your neighbor. But it starts with the primary one. So coloring, causing, and covering are three things that he hits on. So what shall we do? That's a very fine question. You know, I get this from the students, you know, various forms. What do I need to know for the test? <laughs> well, a lot of things, you know. <laughs> you know, a lot of education isn't about the what. It is about the who, you know, and what kind of, I kind of just said, but what kind of person are you? So this is the, the, we're developing the who there. And we trust that, you know, the developed who will turn into a very good what, you know, in terms of actions. Uh, but, you know, a lot of ethics classes then will drill down on the what. What are you supposed to do in this particular situation? And I, I don't want to deny that that's important. Um, but what Luther's really laying out here, I, you can tell me if I'm mastering the, the, the philosophical terms here or not, but it's, it's more like an ontological kind of ethics. Let's get back to who you are as a being first, and then we can work out to some other things, right? And I don't even think you know, you're going to get away with that you know, certainly at public institutions, to say, you know, fundamentally before we talk about what you're going to do, we're going to talk about who you are, you know, because either that's going to divulge into all sorts of celebration of <laughs> things that we might not want to condone or praise, right? And we're going to come to a certain place to say, there's only one kind of who you should be. And by the way, let's read Psalm 1, right? There's another who, and that one perishes apart from God, right? And, and that's scandalous, of course. But good news is you guys can do this in yeah, Lutheran classical schools. <coughs> you drill down on the who. Uh, so, the, you know, what shall I do is a good question, uh, but it can't be divorced from the who, right? So, um, Again, it's always in relationship to God and then the neighbor. Could we address what you just talked about the who? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I believe strongly that that is one thing that we as Lutherans have failed to really emphasize as much as we should because of the essence of who we are in Christ. Um, and when we tend to go into the faith of the words, faith of the teachings, or whatever, we lose track of the essence. And the essence of who we are in Christ is the most important. So even though other people may answer in different ways, fantastic times to actually um, direct the whole conversation back to Christ and who we are. Now that's just my personal uh, point of view, but I really think uh, that that has to be emphasized in you may be getting to this, but um, when you were talking about what and who, it reminded me of the Good Samaritan and the, the, the person upon which the story that Jesus told was predicated. He asked a what question, what must I do? And Jesus answers it with a who. Who is your neighbor as he finishes the story? Right. And, and, and so, yeah, very much. Good, good point. And the what comes out of the who? Who is my neighbor? What does my neighbor need? And who am I at this moment in time? I'm the person passing by who can help. And I don't even have the heavy mandates of being priest and Levi. Right? And I know what to do. Very, yeah, very good point. So I've already kind of beat this one, but. But again, you know, the major point that Luther's making about the good works here is that who matters more than it shapes the what. Who you are, who your neighbor is in the situation at hand is going to shape what you do. Now, obviously, there's what guidelines behind that. Um, 
I'm not denying that. It's not just completely open field. That's not what I'm saying at all. But, but this really dictates it. Right? And of course, who God is, is the great factor right, for you and for others. Or another way that it's talked about today, like Robert Cole and some others, is, is identity precedes and produces activity. Okay? Who your identity, you know, what, what your identity is, who you are, then it is first and foremost, and then leads to the activity. So rather than again saying, you must produce fruits, right? that, that, that's true, but that's not where you want to start. Because a bad tree doesn't produce good fruits. So you got to start with the roots, right? you got to start with the tree, you got to start with the identity. Now, fortunately for us Lutherans, this is a really key term that we can use in today's debates about identity politics and identity ethics. Right? Because people latch on to that. A uh, nice little piece in issues, I uh, forget the exact name, issues in Christian education, issues in education from Nebraska, and I'm just the title. Remember the title of it, the journal comes out of Issues in education. I think it was last summer. A colleague of mine did a boy did a piece in there on, on identity politics and, 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 and linking identity and activity and how, and how that's come about. Right. Well, it's worthwhile for us as Lutherans to think about well, you know what, identity and activity is really for us too. Um, and, and we have a, a heritage on this one, so we want to want to know what it is so we can converse with other people. I believe it's a plus here, actually, that uh, always encourages to ask the question, is this consistent with my baptized life? Um, do, you, do you think that that's a helpful <coughs> frame? Because when we consider our baptized life, our identity is intricately connected to Christ. So it's like we're baptized into Christ. Right, right, right. And of course, this is where you know, Luther would get into um, being a Christ of my neighbor. So yeah, being baptized into Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. So what is that? Yeah. yeah, that's coming at it from the sacramental end, which is correct. Luther doesn't go from that end as much as is being uh, united to Christ. They'll talk about the wedding ring of faith, right? The great exchange. So we're, we're married to Christ, and in this wedding, there's an exchange of gifts. And, and this is a very unequal exchange. So if you haven't read this piece on the Freedom of Christian, it's a wonderful exposition on this kind of mystical marriage, right? So what, if we're coming to the wedding and we're going to marry Christ, what's our gift to Christ? All these, you know, part of the friend trappy things, right? Sin, death, right? Doubt, disloyalty, all those sort of, all those sort of things. We go, Here, here's our gift, right? And what does Christ give us? The faith, righteousness, eternal life. We get these things. And this is, this is also received through that Christ's vocations of priest and king. There's this great exchange, yeah. Now this happens in baptism, but what Luther will focus on is that faith moment, that wedding ring of faith. Uh, a Christian man living in this faith has no need of a teacher of good works. I hear echoes of Jeremiah here, right? You will not need the new covenant, right? God will forgive all your sins, and uh, you will not need to tell your neighbor, know the Lord. It's not just know that there's a God who exists, to know who that God is and what God has done for you and what that means for your life, right? You won't need to teach your neighbor to know God because they're all going to go, yeah, 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 I got that, right? That identity, I think, is, is so profound where you can basically talk about how in the Christian life works and being are such that you do as you are, you do not become as you do. Yeah, hold on to that, because we're, we're going to go over that little ride here in a moment. Don't need a teacher of good works, and this is not to put you out of a job. <laughs> right? Saint, sinner, we don't want to forget that. We're really focusing on the saint aspect here, obviously. Uh, but he does... She does whatever the occasion calls for, and, and all is done well. Situational, neighbor, you know, neighbor-centered, gospel-motivated kind of ethics here, right? If every man had faith, we would need no more laws. Everyone would of himself do good works all the time as his faith shows him to do. 
in the moment and in what's needed. Yes? This uh, who, what, in proper order, and the clarity that Luther gives it to us, I think then it helps us to see the neighbor not as a what anymore. <coughs> but you begin to see them as a who. And I think, you know, that humility aspect, we begin to, as we see them as a who, I, I think perhaps we begin to see ourselves as what. What can I do? You know, what am I not? I mean, you hear Christ himself talking about, you know, I'm a worm and not a man. You know, and that descent there um, is quite profound. So seeing the neighbor as a who, and not a what, a stepping stone for my own good works. Yeah. Thank you. Roller coasters, right? Oh, so here's a little bit to you. Okay, so Luther hates Aristotle. Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Melanchthon's more favorable to him, but they're actually looking at Aristotle for different things in that sense. You know, Luther doesn't. There's particular things that Luther doesn't like about Aristotle, and it's the way Aristotle gets used and played, right, for this issue. So this faith first approach to virtue, you know, it contrasts, you know, you know, directly with Luke, what Luther doesn't like about Aristotle. Here's a quote from Luther. According to Aristotle, righteousness follows upon actions and originates them. Righteousness follows upon actions and originates in them. But according to God, righteousness precedes works, right? And so the quote that he goes to in Nicomachean Ethics is this. We must become just by doing just acts. Right? And we don't want to fall into that trap of emphasizing the what, 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 therefore thinking who's different just by that. Or how, or how many much how much I prune the tree that produces rotten fruit, it's not gonna produce good fruit. Okay. Now it might produce less bad fruit if I trim it way back, right? But but again, it's primarily you gotta get to the who. And we do want to pay attention to the use of the law and you know what does it work with Christians and non-Christians. We don't want to lose sight of that. But we're talking fundamentally about the tree and the roots, right? And and so he's gonna, you know, these things, you know, uh, we toss out, kind of part of it, right? We must become just by doing just acts. It's not gonna work for Luther when it comes to truly being just. It's the exact opposite, right? And, and so this Aristotelian approach, and I call it Aristotelian approach because Aristotle wasn't looking at the gospel when he said this, okay? Um, you know, Aristotle was looking at the public realm. And, and he did have his eye quite a bit on the paradise that would come, and that's a whole other topic about what he thinks about what the good life is and how to get there. Um, but, but just for this particular point, which makes a person truly just, <clears throat> we want to, you know, make sure that this this Aristotelian approach of just works makes you just. That we we see this um, that this, you know, is uh, you know perhaps okay, right? In the civil political realm and civic righteousness, where natural law can curb vice and corral people toward virtue, right? What what use of law would that be? You know, the first use, right? The civil realm use, right? There's a place for that, but that doesn't make you truly righteous, right? That makes you righteous civically, right? Uh, true righteousness will only come by means of faith in Christ. What do I do? To, you know, what do I need to do? Be passive. There's a contradictory, right? He's telling you to do something you can't. But, but that—that's where it starts. Now, Luther, is he, his, he lashes out at people occasionally. And so he lashes out at ignorant, blind teachers. Have caused Christians uh, to be weak in faith. Because ignorant, blind teachers have caused them to trust in the law, works, and culture for righteousness. Do these things, and you will be righteous. What do I need to do? 
follow this pilgrimage, do this fast, right? Be chased, all these sorts of things that you weren't going to find in God's Decalogue, right? Do these things, right? Now, how does Luther approach these new Christians? Because I bet we have some of them. You might even have some in your own household. You might even be one of them. <laughs> and, and, and how do you approach these Christians? Here's the pastoral heart of Luther. Because you might say, just rip Aristotle off, right? And, and all these other kind of works that people latch on to. And what he, what he puts forth is this uh, patient sound instruction. Uh, they talk about weak Christians are lusty and childish in their understandings of such faith and the spiritual life, and they must be coaxed like young children, enticed with externals, with reading, praying, fasting, singing, churches, decorations, organs. I don't be interested in what he means by churches, but anyway, he said it, not me. Decorations, organs, and I think he means the organs, right? And all those things commanded and observed in monasteries and churches, until such time as they too learn to know the teachings of faith itself. Those strong in the faith must tolerate and instruct them. And I think tolerate is more than just kind of a passing, you know, but it's, it means be patient. They must lead, they must be led back to faith again. Pass it. So what do you do when people are relying upon these cultural works and whatever it says to do is right? Well, you don't rip it off entirely. Like you don't take the training wheels off entirely because He's concerned about their faith and conscience. He's very concerned about their conscience that they not fall away and that, you know, and break up. And so it's the steady steps to bring them to faith, to Christ, and trust in that alone. And then he'll give them back the externals once they know that they're free in them, right, rather than the thing itself. So there is a place for these externals, particularly when you're dealing with people who <coughs> you got to wean them off. Christ, faith, faith, Christ, right? Now this movement is echoed later in a sermon on three kinds of good life for the instruction of consciences from 1521. Three kinds of good life for the instruction of consciences. This is a little sermon he wrote for his parishioners to try to bring to bear in an understandable way what he's talking about in these larger and uh, I'm very happy to put these slides up on a website where everybody can get them but I don't want to you know, take away your don't take me skills either <laughs> now here Luther uses church architecture as the, as the driving metaphor for what he's going to talk about is this mode of this, this, this major image Okay, now he, he draws on the Old Testament of, you know, temple of courtyard, holy place, and holy of holies where God was above the Ark of the Covenant. And he, he then maps that onto what you see, you know, in churches. There's the courtyard. Well, we might have too many courtyards today, but other places have courtyards, okay. And they might have graves and whatever you go through. But the churchyard, the nave, and the sanctuary... And got, Luther uses these to sketch the three kinds of good life and good works. So just use your imagination. You're in the courtyard. You put in whatever you want in the church courtyard, fountain, whatever. Parking lot if you want. I mean, there are protocols to the parking lot, right? So, um, reserved for, you know. Now, these churchyard saints, as Luther calls them, they focus on outward works such as ceremonies, performances, techniques, dress, diet, and ultra, other cultural aspects of church. You know I'm a saint. Why? Because I do all the right things, and I dress in the right way. And, you know, just visit churches, and you can see this on display, right? Now, this is not to say that there's a separation Holy right between church and theology and what goes on in terms. But, but he's picking on those who would say, here are the things you must do, and I've done these things, right? These man-made things, which God didn't command or forbid, necessarily. But, you know, it's this churchyard stuff. 
uh, and I put I put cultural aspects in there. He didn't put that in there, but that's that's the drum he's beating, right? These things that are, are, are good in their place, right? It's kind of like the Ecclesiastes thing of you know, is is you know, is home, house, spouse, you know, drink, good? Yeah. Should we worship them? No. Right. So are these things good for the for the Christian life? Yeah. But do we make that the the be and end all? No, that's silly, right? Uh, now, these these things make nobody righteous because they're just external man-made works. God's going to look at them and say, oh, I don't remember saying anything about that, right? Now, the natural man, as he says, and I be, believe this is, you know, post, you got to get out of the garden, natural man. Uh, this person enters the nave. Okay, and this person truly wants to live, learn, and live by the godly virtues. And here are godly virtues: humility. Now you know they're godly because they're in the name, right? Humility, meekness, gentleness, peace, fidelity, love, propriety, purity, and the like. This person really wants to learn and live by these things. This is this is a good life too. Now Luther doesn't make this distinction, but I think I will. And you can, I mean, I'm wrong, but these three good lives and good works that Luther's putting out here, he's not putting them apart with each other. Okay? It's like the first one he's saying here is good works. Right? These are apparently good because church culture or whatever culture tells you to do them, and therefore you do them, therefore you're good. It's a good life. That's, that's like uh, apparently good. The, this, these godly virtues, I, I, I think I put them as possibly good. No, they, they are good, right, in that sense. I'm not going to say that humility is not good. Um, you know, but Luther says here, the proper, this, this is the proper road to piety and holiness, but because people do them the wrong way, they, you know, they use them to serve the self and one's own righteousness and vanity, right? I do, I'm humble, God, right? Look at me, God, I'm humble. Right? That's the wrong way. Right? Did you see how I gave that homeless person some money? You know, do you remember when I forgave you? You know? Wrong way. You know, then then their dead works in God's eyes. That that's why they're possibly good. It's because of you. <laughs> it's not the what at that point, it's the who. You know, that they're, they're possibly good. Uh, you know, but therein lies the problem. No one is righteous, not even one. This is to remind you that after chapel, well, I'm gonna put on. <laughs> and and then there are the children and heirs. And they enter the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, the place where God is truly present. Right? And it's not the sanctuary. It's the, the sanctuary tells you where God is, truly. Right? And, and here, these people receive Christ's righteousness by means of faith. And the Holy Spirit makes a pure, free, cheerful, glad, and loving heart. A heart which is simply, gratuitously righteous. And does the nave virtues that we just walked through, we couldn't do. Right? And does the nave virtues in response to Christ and for the sake of the benefit of the neighbor. That's a truly good life, right? That's the actual good life because it's given to you. And then you go do it. Right? And so there's this motion of walking through the nave to the sanctuary and to go back and do the do the nave virtues. It can just almost track right to the whole paragraph. Call, gather, and enlighten the sanctuary. And you can just say it right through there. Yeah. And then at this point, Luther says, these people, the children and the heirs, right, are free and unfettered in external matters. 
and Adiapa, those things that are indifferent. Now you can go back out into the churchyard, and guess what? You're not bound to do those things. Because you don't need to do them for salvation. We're not going to give it to you anyway. But you're not bound by them. You're free from condemnation. And you look at these things and you say, no. well, I don't have to do them for salvation at all, right? But, I, but we're free and unfettered to choose what we want to do. Now, let's qualify this, obviously, for the sake of Christ. For the sake of the neighbor, we're free in these things to decide what's best to do in relation to God and in relation to our neighbor. We're free and better in the churchyard. You know, the good life is also the churchyard, but it's not first. It's third. Right? The sanctuary is what matters most. When you walk out and you're able to do the main virtues and then make decisions individually and collectively about what's best to do with these external things for the sake of what we've just received right? for our neighbor who may not even be in the courtyard or maybe in the courtyard right? and you can with we Christians of course you obviously see what you got to do is lead on into the sanctuary you've got to give an altar call with the right way <laughs> I think that's a helpful image. Certainly not the only one. So, you know, you have this apparent possible and actual good life. But then, you know, because of the actual good life you receive, they all become actually good when done in faith to Christ and love for the neighbor. But we always want to keep those things in mind in their proper place. All right, so some, some last things here. Uh, these biblical themes of faith to virtue and who before what, uh, they raise some important ideas and questions for C.C. Lee schools to think about in terms of pedagogy of goodness. Um, I'm going to use the, the three-part structure here to, for these questions. You know, so what priority, role, emphasis... Uh, should the externals of the school have an instilling virtue in students? Remember back to that one piece by Sam, I think Benaplast is his name. Make sure that all of your external things push the virtues. And unfortunately, that was the sum total of his piece. Right? So he's clearly walking around in the churchyard at that point, or the schoolyard. You can flip this if you want. You know, but he's clearly walking around that. And there's a place for it, but that's the only place he's walking around. Is the churchyard. You know, so how should freedom in Christ be preserved and you preserved? That is key. We do want to preserve our freedoms here, you know, with these externals. We don't want to be bound more than, we, you know, on, on these sort of things. How should freedom in Christ be preserved and used for cultivating faith in other virtues? You do want to use the externals. You do live in culture. And thank God for that. You know, this is part of our creative realm. Subcreators. You know, my co creator, that's the so called the subcreators is all well, right? There is a place for this, so how, how are we going to use these externals? Use them well and intentionally, thoughtfully, for the sake of faith and virtue. What place should read now we're in the nave, right? What place should reading about and imagining Virtues, <clears throat> teachers modeling them, and the students practicing virtues have what you know. What place should these have? And to be thinking about, they obviously do have a place, but what place? And, and what uses, use or uses of the law are in play when that's happening? So if you have a student read a text that you know praises the virtues, what's that doing to the individual student? Okay, now here I have to always have to put on my pastor's cap because you never know what the effect is going to be except in the rain of effects, right? It may be that it's curbing a student, first use from doing something wicked. It may be that it shows the student that he or she's crying. I mean, it's not a theological term, but it works. Or it may show the student, oh, this is how I ought to live in response to 
Christ, and that's a fully formed me saying it, not a third grader, but, but you know, the guy moment. Uh, or it, maybe the Christian may be looking at it and saying, and I don't exactly know where I'd want to put this, but crucifying the flesh. That I ought not be that way because of my baptism. Has that occurred? The use of the law? Could be. But for a Christian, be crucifying, mortifying the flesh. What's at play here when you have students do this? I, I don't know what the answer is on that one. I'm just saying you should be thinking about it. Because these fall under the law. Uh, the, the sanctuary. How does the school make faith in Christ the foundation for all of the virtues? That's what Luther's putting out there, right, based on Scripture. Is and is faith given space to percolate? I'm pausing for a reason because we don't pause in education often. What's the next learning objective? What's the next state standard? And maybe you're free from that. And God bless you. But there's still always the more, 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 as opposed to the rest and let it percolate. Do we let faith percolate in students and let it motivate them, right, and educate them for how they are to live virtuous lives and the callings they already have now, right, and then percolate on that, remain on for those vocations that they might have in the future. But to let the faith percolate. And instead of always immediately going to the what should you do, right? I'm saying give plenty of space for the who you are. <coughs> that is it.